Well, Merry Christmas, everyone. It is Christmas Eve, and uh, we are glad that you are joining us. I know that there's a lot of festivities that are probably happening in your house, and if you have children, they're probably excited and probably hard to have them sit down. And so uh, we wanted to try and put something together. And on behalf of uh, the staff and the elders and everyone in the Bethel family, we wanted to say uh, Merry Christmas. And we wanted to try and put something together uh, which had some relevance and, and had uh, some meaning. What a year it has been. Uh, who would have thought uh, in March that um, we would still be in the midst of the complications of a, a pandemic? And if uh, you would have a word to maybe describe what is happening at uh, this Christmas, maybe that word would be um, unconventional. Things are a little bit different, and uh, maybe you're celebrating Christmas, and as you're celebrating Christmas and you're sitting there or you're celebrating with family and friends, you're realizing that it's a little bit different than other Christmas. And uh, if, you're, if you're watching and everything is exactly the same as it has been year after year, then I'll just say this, that you are incredibly blessed. I know for myself, this is going to be um, the first time that I am going to be uh, celebrating Christmas uh, without family. I haven't seen my family for some time. As a matter of fact, a number of us who might be watching have had a hard time not being able uh, to see and, and visit um, uh, family. Um, so here's the thing. In the midst of this uh, different Christmas, um, I'm wondering if it might be a Christmas time that may resemble more of um, what the original Christmas season was like. It was unconventional. It was uncomfortable. Uh, you may want to call it a bare essentials Christmas. And this might not be a bad thing. Because sometimes it takes those moments when God takes a number of those things that we think are important to us away and strips away some of the, the essentials that we have been used to for a number of years to actually take a look and see Christmas uh, for, a, uh, for what it is in the first respects as to when we originally seen Christmas. Um, you know, we know that it's not about the gifts. We know that it's not about the food. We know that it's not about the lights and the trees and the glitters. And, and, and we know that even though family is a wonderful thing, that ultimately it is not about family. Christmas has a simple and a profound message. And it is one thing and one thing only that it is about. And it is a time where we think about joy and peace and good news and hope. Because God came down as man and resolved the issue of sin for you and me. It's a wonderful thing. But sometimes it gets caught up in all the distractions of other things. And what happens when, when we don't have those distractions? Well, what happens is we're able to see Christmas in a new light. And this is what we're hoping to perhaps uh, show you uh, this evening. You know, it says in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, a virgin will uh, conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And no matter what this pandemic has taken away from us, it will never, ever take away the fact that there is a God who came and provided a solution for us. And that's a wonderful thing. So enjoy as we present to you a Bare Essentials Christmas. Hey, Ed, come check out my North Star Christmas tree topper at Levitate's. Is this a gummy bear? Yeah, we lost baby Jesus. Hey, check out these LED lights. I have them synced up to a 76 hour all Christmas music playlist. There's my little Christmas DJ. <laughs> <laughs> So, are you waiting till Christmas is over so you can go buy a new nativity set when they're on sale? Huh? No, no, oh no. We lost baby Jesus like 11 years ago. Is, is baby Jesus always a gummy bear? Oh, no, no, oh, we trade it out every year. Yeah, like uh, last year it was a uh, tiny troll doll. 
And the year before that, we used uh, dog treat. They were the perfect size, but <laughs> Dalton kept taking them and eating them. You, you mean your dog kept stealing them? No, my son Dalton, he loves those dog treats. Especially the peanut butter ones. There was one year that we used a, uh, a doll head. That was creepy. We, we made a modeling clay, baby Jesus. So the dog took that one too. Um, one year we got desperate and used an ice cube. That was a miss and a mess. Yeah, just seems like everything we try to replace baby Jesus with never lasts. Say that again. Everything we try to replace baby Jesus with never seems to last. And? And what? Say it again, slowly. Why? Just do it, dulcimo, slowly, do it. I don't understand what's happening. Just do it. This is getting weird. Dang it! Fine! But when I'm done saying this, you're gonna march in here and you're gonna watch my star levitate. I'm fine, 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 do it. Fine. Everything we try to replace baby Jesus with never seems to, oh, yep, there it is, okay. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. It starts with a story of a baby born in Bethlehem. It ends with the glory of a spotless lamb being raised again. The earth is rejoicing, heaven and nature sing its Christmas morning. Come and see what the angels say this blessed morning. The God so loved that he gave his son, oh Jesus Christ has come, his Christmas. The shepherd's tale of the first Noel. Redemption is calling as good tidings ring of a newborn king. The earth is rejoicing. Heaven and nature sing its Christmas morning. What was Mary doing when the angel came? She was getting wa water from a well. Selling. Mm -hmm. What was he doing? Leaving. Praying to God. Jesus. Talking to the angel. Gabriel. What did Gabriel, the angel, tell Mary was going to happen? Fire. That she would be having this, the Messiah, the Son of God. That she was going to have baby Jesus. She was Worried. A little bit of food. A little bit of food. Frightened. 
When Joseph heard the news, what was his response? Um, he was he was mad. He got scared. It was a lot to take in, and he was happy for Mary. He was scared, and he thought there was a bear. He was scared because this is going to be probably really tough for him. And how did Mary and Joseph get to Bethlehem? They rode a donkey. And it was very hard for them. It was a very long journey. And when they got there, there was no hotels or anything that they could stay in, so they st stayed in a barn. Where did Mary and Joseph have baby Jesus? In their tummy. Who is that? Baby. In the table. Because all of the hotels were full. In a manger. In Bethlehem. For women who are nine months pregnant, traveling is uncomfortable. I mean, I don't think anything's uncomfortable from what I've seen when you're that pregnant. My wife, Trisha and I have four children and I don't remember her saying, boy, I'm really comfortable carrying around this eight pound child. No. So you can imagine traveling at full term or close to full term all the way from Nazareth to Bethlehem. That would have been quite the journey. Uh, it's about 150 kilometers and would take about an hour and 53 minutes by car. Thanks, Google Maps. But on the back of a mule, more like five days, the experts say. Five days of traveling, being that pregnant, that's not comfortable. That's very uncomfortable. What an uncomfortable journey. It was long, it was tiring, it was certainly take a lot of patience, and it was certainly risky. There was a good chance a person could die. I mean, why would God ask someone to do this, especially when they're being obedient to him? Does this sound familiar? I don't know about you, but it seems like we've been on a long journey this year. Seems like it's going on forever, taking up all of our patience, lots of worry and fear, and with the threat that we could die. What is the purpose of such a long trip? 
You and I have questions, don't we? Maybe it means we have to be faithful no matter what the journey. That God fulfills his promise despite the difficult road. That maybe it was never meant to always be easy. It took everything my wife had to carry our children and to give birth to them. In those last moments when it looked like she had already given everything, she found more strength. She found more determination. And I'm sure it was the same for Mary. It would have taken everything to travel for five days, then to give birth after a long journey like that? Maybe it feels like you've given everything to get through this Christmas or this pandemic. If this uncomfortable journey has not been easy for you and it's taken everything you have to give, then the story of Mary should give you hope. That God is with you, that God has a plan, that he's with you in the pain then he will get you through it if you trust him. God always has a way if you trust him. What happens in the fields during Jesus' birth? Um, sheep. <laughs> the shepherds. Don't be afraid. I have good news. The angels sing. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. And then there's, there are more lights and there are more angels and it's a glory be to God. Sad. I met go to Bethlehem and see the newborn king. What did King Herod think when Jesus was born? Very angry because he wanted to be the king forever. Uh, he wanted to kill him because it was interfering with him being king and he didn't like it. Who came to visit baby Jesus and what did they bring? The wise man. They brought gold, myrrh, and frankincense. Barbados. And they brought good tidings. One of them brought Frankenstein or something. Frankenstein! <laughs> They brought gold, myrrh, and frankincense. With gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Ooh, presents. Gold, frankincense, and oil. A part of gold, I think, and a chest. I can't remember what else, but there was. Was it a pirate's chest? No.
Have you ever looked at a typical Christmas card? You know, a manger, starry night, shepherds, angels, and of course, right at the center, Jesus and Mary. Ah, <sighs> beautiful, isn't it? Except there's one thing. It's not necessarily 100% accurate. You see, if we look at it from a historical point of view, more than likely, Jesus would have been born in a cave. There would have been a trough, animals, it would have been damp, and of course, stinky, but it wouldn't have looked the way that we think it looks today. Now, if you ask me, that doesn't sound fair to Mary. If I was Mary, I would have had high expectations and probably a couple plans. But as we know, there's no point of doing that. Mary faced a lot of issues from the very beginning. First of all, she faced the possibility of divorce. Then she faced a long journey to get to Bethlehem. And of course, at this point, you think she would get a hotel room. But no, she ends up in a cave. To me, if you ask that, that's not fair. But if you look at the first Christmas, you can kind of define it by a few words, one of which would be basic or minimal. In fact, the first Christmas had very little things. They would have never had the things that we have today, like Toblerones, Christmas trees, stockings, cards, and family. It would have been a very bare minimal. <laughs> Try putting that on a Christmas card. But the beautiful part about the first Christmas is that there was something extraordinary in the ordinary. And it started off really ugly. And if we're to look at 2020, I think that's a perfect word to describe it. Ugly. Now, I kind of laugh when I, about a year ago today, I was comparing 2020 to perfect vision. Now, none of us could have seen this past year coming. Silly to look at it that way now. This past year, it seems like if there was anything that could have gone wrong, it did. So what does that mean for us in this Christmas season? You see, Mary had every reason to complain about what was going on. But when we look at the scriptures, it doesn't say much about what she said, except for very few statements. One of which can be found in Luke 1, verse 38. And this is just after the angel had spoken to her. Her words were, I am the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled through me. That's incredible to think. At least I think so, at least. But if Mary was able to do that on the first Christmas, what does that mean for us today? when all of our world seems to not be going the way we expect. And our, 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 our t Christmas card doesn't match our reality of what we want. What does that mean? Does God not care about us anymore? Has he forgotten about us? No, not at all. But actually, if we look at the first Christmas, it's a sign to show us that God is in it. God is with us, and he has not forgotten about us. We're right where we're supposed to be. You see, I think this Christmas, we should take a look at what Mary said on that day. We are the Lord's servants. May God's will be done through us this Christmas. Merry Christmas! This is the season that we celebrate the birth of Jesus, but sometimes we get so caught up in decking the halls, do we ever really stop to think about the meaning of all those decorations? Take the Christmas tree, for instance. Some people say that it's a symbol of everlasting life. I love that. I just love Christmas trees. <laughs> now, while Melinda is setting ours up, I thought I would read you my very favorite Christmas carol. Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, thy leaves are so unchanging, not only green when summer's here, but also when it's cold and drear. Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree, thy leaves are so unchanging. 
a symbol of goodwill and love, you'll ever be unchanging. Each shining light, each silver bell, no one alive spreads cheer so well. O oh, Christmas tree, O oh, Christmas tree, thy leaves are so unchanging. Wow, <laughs> Linda, this is beautiful. Thank you. You did a great job. You know, the, the leaves of the evergreen really are unchanging. Yeah. <gasps> you were listening to my song. I like your song. Well, it's just like God. I mean, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's true. I just love the evergreen. I love how it just lasts all year long and, and it even stands up through the harshest winter storms. Mm -hmm. And that reminds me of God's unfailing love for me. You're right. It, it also gives us a different perspective on the Christmas tree. Yep. Well, because the main thing is to keep the main, main thing, thing the, the main, main thing. thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is the main thing. Thank you, Christmas tree. Thanks, tree. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. You know, the lights on the tree remind me that Jesus is the light of the world. Oh, did you know in the old times they used to put candles on the tree to light it? Nuh uh. Really? Well, how do they keep from burning their house down? I have no idea. Huh. <gasps> hey! No. What does Christmas mean to you? What do you guys think about Christmas? It's fun. Christmas means joy happy, and happiness. And my favorite part of Christmas is Jesus' birth. Remembering that the best gift in the world is the gift of life. Having fun with my family. Giving people stuff in their car. Probably all of it. What's your favorite part about Christmas? The baby! This. The animal. When they can't find seeds. Probably opening up presents on Christmas morning and eating shrimp. Opening up presents and seeing what God gave us. Having fun. Christmas light. Christmas light, okay. Christmas tree, Christmas present. Seeing what I get from what God and He's so special to me. Uh, say presents. Is one with the current stocking, I will put presents under the tree. Is the Christmas presents, the Christmas tree, the Christmas lights, and the Christmas stuff. Merry Christmas!
So we have learned about the uncomfortable journey. We have learned about the uncomfortable surroundings. Um, what about the uncomfortable occupation? Now, there's a lot of questions you can ask, and you have probably heard a lot of sermons and messages uh, on Christmas story. Uh, the one thing I often ask myself is, why is it that the angels are requested to um, uh, announce and proclaim the Messiah's entry into this world because of shepherds? Well, I've heard a number of things over the years. I, the one thing that I have heard is that these particular shepherds were special in that they were the shepherds that were guarding the sheep that were used for the temple uh, sacrifices. And so, so therefore, this proclamation being made was to a number of shepherds who knew that these sheep were going to be sacrificed for our sins. And, and Jesus coming meant that this was no longer going to be the case. The other thing that I've heard a lot is that when you consider the lives of uh, shepherds, uh, it's probably not the best profession in, in the world. As a matter of fact, these people were, were outcasts. These were people that were not really viewed as, as the, the upper people in society. And so what happens is they were kind of relegated to outside of the community. And so when this proclamation was made, um, the inference that was given was that uh, the, the gospel proclamation was not necessarily to the most important people, but to the most unimportant people. That the proclamation and the truth and the, the good news of the gospel is not just for those people who are special, but the good news of the gospel is for everyone. Whatever way you want to take uh, the truths of the scripture, and they very well could both be true, is this. I think it would be a lousy job to be a shepherd. That is in case you like loneliness. And not too many people of us like loneliness when it comes down to it. The job of a shepherd would be dull, dark, uneventful, lonely, listless, dull. And I think that that is something which becomes a reality at Christmas, and it is something that really becomes a reality when we think of Christmas uh, this year. And Bible talks about this right at the very beginning in Genesis chapter 2 when it says that it is not good for man to be alone. And what aloneness does is it brings discouragement, and discouragement will bring isolation, which will bring depression, which leads down a whole bunch of different paths. And, and loneliness thwarts the fundamental urge for connection. Even from the day that you were born, you've wanted people around. And so this becomes a serious issue. And, and if loneliness has a good part about it, and I'm not too sure if there is a whole lot of good about it, but if it does have a good point about it, it is this that the times when I am the loneliness and the times that I have discovered when I am the loneliness, that there are other sensations that all of a sudden become very acute and very aware that, that sometimes my hearing and my listening becomes a little bit more better. I'm not distracted by other things. And I become more hungry to hear of things that have real substance. And I begin to be hungry to hear from the creator of the universe. And herein is perhaps something that we see, that perhaps the loneliness that some of us are, are um, dealing with, uh, we set, tend to think of it as a curse, but maybe in this instance, and bear with me here, maybe in this instance here, it might be an opportunity. Because in a proclamation of Christmas, there is this thought, that there is joy in the fact that you will never be alone because there is a God who provided a way for you. There's joy, and at least this is what the shepherds saw. This is what, the, what was, was going on in their lives. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. In the midst of loneliness, solitude, isolation, seclusion, there's a message that they have received that is for us today, and this message is clear. You are not alone. And that will never, ever be taken away from you. So in the midst of this, and whatever this time clears, there is something which is true that rings not just during Christmas time, but throughout Christmas time is the fact that Jesus came, provided a way for you and for me. And could you imagine that this proclamation wasn't made? If you could, would you imagine what would happen if we don't have this type of hope? 
well, the world would be a pretty lonely place, wasn't it? And so he wasn't just a savior, and he wasn't just the Christ, but he was Lord. You see, when the shepherds had heard the proclamation of Jesus, they would have said, yes, yes. And then they would have said, wow. When it says that unto you is born a savior, they knew exactly from the scriptures that that was what was going to happen. And when they heard the word that there was, he was going to be Christ, well, Christ actually means the anointed one. They knew that there was going to be an anointed one. But when all of a sudden they used the term Lord, that left no doubt as to what they were saying, that this was actually God. What? You actually are trying to tell me that God was born? This would have blown them away. This would have been so incredibly spectacular to them that as they walked away, and I could just imagine uh, going through this situation where in the middle of the darkness there's this host of angels and lights and, and, and these wonderful things happening. But as they began to walk away, as they went to that search, there probably was that thing inside of them that said, well, yes, he's the Savior. This is wonderful. Yes, he's the anointed one. But God? And this is probably something which is the most profound thing about Christmas that many times we miss. He was God. And that is something for us to celebrate in the midst of a good Christmas, in a bad Christmas, in a normal Christmas. And so that is something that Perhaps as we, we end our time or as we draw this time to a close, uh, as you gather and you, you open up your Christmas gifts and, and as you spend some time together and perhaps you are going to be uh, uh, phoning friends and family more than you obviously uh, would have done in years past, here's the thing. No matter what has happened in the Christian life, there's this. There's always hope. There's always joy. And there's always an aspect of thanksgiving and gratitude in our heart, which says, thanks God, thanks for what you've done. Thanks for providing a way. And in doing that, I can always have joy. I can always have peace in the midst of whatever situation is. I just wanna say this again, and I know I said it at the beginning, Merry Christmas. It's a pleasure to serve you. I know as a staff, it is a pleasure to serve you. And we're looking forward to God doing some great things as we worship him together as a church family. Have a great Christmas, everyone, and God bless you.